Father Tyson came closer, pulled out a sheaf of papers and began to read from them. It was a copy of His Holiness, Pope Leo XIII's prayer for use in performing what the Catholic Church terms a simple exorcism to curb the power of the devil and prevent him from doing harm. Father Tyson began, Glorious Prince of the Celestial Host, Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in the conflict. Rocaciously loud, demonic chuckles interrupted Father Tyson's reading. He tried to continue. Which we have to sustain against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world is darkness, against the spirits of wickedness in. Smoke began to rise slowly from the papers in his hands. A heavy black haze blanketed Tyson's head and face. He gasped for air, choked and backed away. The exorcism prayer fell from his hands. It burst into flames, burned brightly, then went out. And all that remained was a pile of unrecognizable ashes. That ridiculous garbage won't work on me, retorted the demon. Hi, and welcome to the first episode of Tales of Glory. This is the podcast where we'll discuss amazing stories of the glory of God Most High. We'll take a look at tales of miraculous signs, wonders of our amazing God, God's healings, His glory stories of spiritual warfare, battling the occult, and exorcisms. I want to thank you for pulling up a chair and sitting alongside our fireside chat and sit back and enjoy. I'm your host, Reverend Michael Norton of M16 Ministries. That's M16 for Mark 16, 16 through 18 Ministries. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They'll drive out demons. They will speak in new languages. They'll pick up snakes. If they should drink anything deadly, it will never harm them. They'll lay their hands on the sick and they will get well. Well, I think I've encountered all those topics right there, except for uh, drinking something to make me sick. So I'm just going to presume in faith that that one works. So who am I? I'm again, I'm of Michael Norton. M16 Ministries is very active in dark battles with the occult. Severe spiritual oppression, hauntings, and intense prayers of liberation involving demonic possessions which most of you call exorcisms, but I believe exorcisms are actually reserved for the Catholic Church, what we call it is liberation prayer. More formally, I like to call it Mark 929 prayer, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So I'm also the author of the popular spiritual warfare series books, A Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare and the Advanced Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare by M16 Training Series. This series has been a phenomenal success in equipping the saints and pre-believers in dealing with battles of the supernatural. So if you're getting into deliverance or you're dealing with some really crazy haunting stuff, again, go check out the M16 training series, a Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare, and the Advanced Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare. There's a lot of books and stuff out there, notebooks on how to do Bible studies, how to learn spiritual warfare, but hey, it doesn't help you. Spiritual warfare is caught and not taught. So I encourage you to do is pick up those books, and if you're stuck in something, these, these books were designed to do that. For those who are, you know, look up something, oh, that's how we do it. Anyhow, um, we've got some exciting material tonight. I wanted to have something exciting from the very first podcast episode we're having here. So I actually came across a story of an exorcism I didn't even know existed back in 1974. Um, it's documented in the book The Devil and Karen Kingston, Chronicles of Demonic Evil, Book 4. And the author is Robert W. Pelton, who appears to have been first-hand account of this exorcism. Like I said, I wasn't aware of it, um, but I guess it's, this book's becoming popular in certain uh, deliverance ministry droves and uh, Bible studies. So I wanted to review it firsthand from my experience I had with the Mark 929, um, dealing with the occult and casting out demons. Um, there's different levels of it. I've heard this presented before from a deliverance minister point of view. But again, I want you to tell you and keep you in mind that there's a difference between deliverance ministry, which is in Luke 10, 19, about the 70 disciples returning say, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name, they obeyed. To what's in Mark 9, 29, where those only come out with fasting and prayer. They're actually two separate ministries and they don't quite cross over very well. So with my experience in the Mark 9, 29 section, I want to go through this uh, book here and kind of um, highlight stuff I see through my eyes. I know people cover it through the deliverance side. I'm not covered through them. Um, dealing with exorcisms. Many times this material is approached through, oh, there's an onion layer of demons on here. And you have to know what the root spirits are, this, this, and that. Many times there aren't. Many times there is no methodology. And that's why I want you to stress to you guys, you get in spiritual warfare. That's why some of these books are useless. The, you, you have these prayers laid out for your notebooks. Step A, step B, and you do this. And it's this kind of demon. Oh, if you got the Pythonic demon, you got this, you got that, you got the Levonic demon. No, you don't know what you're getting. These things are spout up names. They're all liars. And you deal with them one at a time or multiple times they come up and you deal with them through the Holy Spirit as he instructs you. Yes, that means you have to have some sort of discernment. And I think that's kind of avoided too in um, deliverance ministries where people say, I see this demon on you, I see that. And oh my God, my counseling sessions, do I have to undo those? Crazy, crazy, crazy. So 
let's dive into this book. It's, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. To, um, I want to go through, through my eyes. And if there's some things that just raise red flags that, that this actually really happened because it seems kind of weird. Or, hmm, that's kind of interesting how this took place. So let's uh, take a look here at what's going on with this book and The Devil and Karen Kingston. Oh, wait, one other thing before we begin. I almost forgot. How did you guys like that guitar riff in the opening? That's pretty cool, huh? I'd like to throw a shout out to Mateo Vasquez who wrote that for me. Mateo goes back and he and another, his friend is Martel and a few other guys from his church. We did a um, spiritual warfare session at his church and it just so happened I had a house haunting in that neighborhood and I took those gentlemen with me. Mateo was one of them. They were young men at the time. They're grown men now. We didn't know what to count at the house and on the way into the house, we're in this guy's car. He's telling us, um, he sees a young man clear. I guess they're in high school back then, but not now. <laughs> he sees the guy that owned the house looks like a young man in the back seat going, um, the last person out here was a Catholic priest and uh, the spirit just tore the covers off the bed and threw it at him and the uh, and the Catholic priests were out in terror. And I kind of look in the back seat with uh, Mateo and Martel sitting back there. And they're all smiling with this grin, like, come get some. So it's it's just cool. And when we got to the house, it was actually, um, there was demonic manifestations in the house. So when Mateo reached out to me to my call, help, I need a guitar riff. Mateo goes, hey, what, what do you have in mind? And I was saying, wow, Mateo, you know I have in mind. Man, if there was a demon right in front of you, this dude's a worship leader, right? So man, if there's a demon right in front of you, I want you to write me a guitar riff that would just, expel him with the riff and so he went to work and that's what he had so i think that's pretty cool so you got demons in your house play that guitar riff they'll get, get rid of some anyhow i want to give a shout out to mateo and um for giving that guitar riff that i mean i am ecstatic to be able to have that for one of my old crew you know and for this first show anyhow um i don't want to get sidetracked but mateo i can tell i'm very grateful for this and that's an awesome rift so again let's get back to the book now the devil and karen kingston let's dive in as mentioned tonight we're diving into the book the Devil and Karen Kingston by Robert W. Pelton. As I mentioned earlier, Pelton is a first-hand witness of the spiritual battle. His book gives account of an intense three-day session of, he called it an exorcism, but I'm going to call it prayer's liberation, to free a young girl, 13-year-old Karen Kingston. It's not her real name. It was a, a, a pseudonym he gave in the book to protect the real person. Um, Karen Kingston was demonically possessed. So this case purportedly took place in April 1974 in a mental hospital in North Carolina. With two ministers on hand, a Roman Catholic priest, some psychologists, um, a healing minister, a Pentecostal minister, and of course the um, the author himself. It's kind of an interesting case because it's it's quirky. Um, that's why I had a hard time putting this thing together. But who knows? Seventy four. What were these people thinking? This exorcism actually went down as a, a medical experiment, and we'll we'll explain how this unfolds. But they never really explained how they got the pastors and the Roman Catholic priest in there to form an exorcism as a medical experiment. It's just set up that this is what this was, or maybe that's how they presented it so they could have an exorcism. Mental hospital, I don't know, it's confusing. It was never really fully, um, you know, discussed on how this whole thing unf un unfolded. But let's just go with the information we do have right now. The background for the case for tonight. So this is an interesting case to examine in the Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare Crime Scene Investigation Lab. That's what we're doing right now. We're taking this apart. Now let's take a look at the crime scene and what opened up to uh, young Karen Kingston's demonic possession. What we know so far is that Karen Kingston, again, was a pseudonym, not her real name, was born on September 9th, 1960. Her father was an abusive drunk. So apparently one night on July 14th, 1968, I guess Karen's mother had enough. She just snapped and she grabbed, I guess, a butcher knife or something, repeatedly stabbed Karen's father. Karen was on hand. She witnessed this mother, her mother brutally just murdering her father. At the time, Karen was seven years old when this gruesome murder took place right in front of her eyes. So as it turns out, you know, mom went to jail. Mom, Karen's mom was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. So having no one to take care of Karen, she just, you know, at this horrific event, she had no family. So Karen was placed into the foster care system. Hmm. A lot of times that's not the best way to go. Sometimes we get loving parents, sometimes we don't. So it's, you know, it's hard to tell what happened to her. During this time, we don't have a lot of information. So Karen's trauma from witnessing the severe murder, um, she was in her new home with her guardian parents and she exhibited having intense fits of rage. Things went downhill from there for Karen. She experienced a sudden difficulty in learning and she became withdrawn and soon over time she developed more animalistic behaviors. So she's becoming more and more less human and it seemed like she started um, losing her ability to learn. And her IQ started dropping too. This is curious. Sadly, within six months, uh, Karen's guardians returned her back to the state authorities where she was committed. Um, she had severe spe special needs after this time, and she was considered to be a handicapped child. 
So moving forward um, from, I guess, we went from seven years old to eight years old now. Karen now is eight years old in this facility, and her mental abilities are significantly diminishing at an alarming rate. So Robert Pelton in his book describes that Karen became helpless in a vegetative state who couldn't dress herself or go to the bathroom without assistance. Her IQ dropped to below 50. Wow. Okay, so some crazy stuff's going on. Um, severe trauma. You know, she saw her, her, her mom just, my God, just stab her dad to death. At the age of nine, Karen's long brown hair was said to become dull and gritty almost overnight. She then developed a horrible body odor and had open sores in her body they couldn't really treat medically. When Karen was 10, it was reported that her eyes suddenly became crossed. When Karen was 10, it was reported that her eyes suddenly became crossed. Her eyes became a very dull gray color with a light film. That's interesting. Um, it was reported that she appeared to have no life in her eyes and her teeth became spaced apart. As she progressed in her teen years, Karen's entire body began to droop. She was described as appearing like an old hag and had painful knee joints and her left leg was now two inches shorter. At this juncture, the medical profession at this facility was at a loss for providing for Karen. So psychologists were equally bewildered as to what was going wrong with Karen. So enter our pastors. <laughs> this is, I don't know, like it is, I wish they'd spent more time explaining how this whole thing came about. This is crazy because this just wouldn't happen today. No way. They'd be thrown out. So somehow a pastor named Reverend Richard Rogers stumbled into Karen's case. So there's, again, there's no details given in the book on how he got into this. It was probably, you know, through local church or something, you know, word of mouth got out, which is probably how he got in. But from the look of things, this was a divine appointment from God. Uh, this pastor knew how to cast out demons. Let's introduce the ministry team and the medical professionals. So somehow we have a ministry team on site here at the hospital. Again, we don't know how they got in there. Uh, I wish there was some background information that Robert would have thrown in there how they got there. Um, so I said, nowadays, uh, I couldn't go into a, a mental hospital. You know, I'd, I'd have to get, go through leaps and bounds to get in there to do prayer for somebody in the mental institution. So it's kind of interesting how these guys got in. But again, this is the 70s. Things were different. Robert Pelton records that the exorcism of Karen as a scientific experiment. Maybe because the medical profession was at its wit's end with Karen. I don't know. The movie The Exorcist was released in 1973. So I wonder if Karen's disposition resembled anything from the movie. That's what led the medical profession to pursue this experiment. I don't know. It's, it's, it's still interesting that the exorcism was allowed in the state mental facility. You know, that these two just don't go hand in hand at all. Anybody suggesting the exorcism would probably be thrown in the state facility, at least nowadays. So I believe this is all taking place in North Carolina. We don't have a lot of details where it took place. Um, there were reported to be 11 people on hand initially. One nurse left after the first day and was terrified. We'll get into that. Well, I guess when the demon manifestation occurred, it, it violently attacked one of these nurses. It's kind of reminding me of the uh, its similarities to you know Zach Vegas and his demon house. They had that little kid um, that lived in the house and he was taking the protective services and crawled up the wall. I kind of got that feel for that when I first read this initially. Um, you know, it started with 11, so now they're 10, right? People just ran off in terror. Reverend Richard Rogers, he's 28 years old, leading the liberation prayers. They call it the exorcism. I'm going to call it liberation prayers. Let's call it what it is. He was assisted by his wife, Ruth. The husband and wife team fasted one week before the session. Again, this is a Mark 9.29 situation. They fasted before. Comes out with fasting and prayer. A Roman Catholic priest, Father John Tyson, was on hand to assist. Pelton specifically states that Father John never performed any exorcisms nor dealt with demonic activity before this time. The third minister on hand was a Baptist healer, Reverend Donald Sutter. Can I get a name in? <laughs> oh my gosh. Here, he describes as portly, weighing at nearly 300 pounds. Wow, that's a, yeah, I can see a sudden there, Baptist, <laughs> Baptist healer there, right? Uh, the one that keeps dabbing his forehead with, the, uh, with his uh, handkerchief while he's sweating. That's, I get a picture of that. Um, okay, some, so some clues here. Robert Pelton identifies himself as the person who brought the clergy into the hospital for this. He's the one. So the author did it. They were close personal friends to the Robert Pelton. Pelton was on hand to analyze Karen's handwriting during various manifestations. There seems to be a whole missing underlying story at this point as to why we're convinced that this was demonic possession. We don't know why it was yet. And I'm also curious, too, if it was an exorcism, why they brought in handwriting experts. <laughs> you know, um, one, it's today I'd be considered if I gave somebody demon possessed a, a pencil to write something, I'd be afraid they'd chuck it into my neck or my brain or something. Or two, having the demon write something is spirit writing. So I wouldn't have them write anything. You know, I just I wouldn't. Give them the ability to communicate like that. So this whole thing was extremely odd, and to this day it is. So the exorcism was supervised by psychology staff doctors. We have Dr. Manley Fromm, a clinical psychologist, Dr. Dr. Clarence Emory, a psychiatrist, Dr. Julian A. Pershing, a general practitioner, 
And with the institution staff, there were three therapy ner- nurses, Peggy Welch, Carol Peterson, and Joyce Donaldson. Nancy Lay, an aunt of Pelton's and a ward supervised institution where Karen was committed, was also on hand. So the dates of the exorcism are April 13th through the 15th, 1974, at the Children's Mental Institution in North Carolina. Huh. Curious, curious stuff. Um, you know, the 70s, we keep going back to that. We, we titled it The Satanic Panic Now. And as I look back to it, my ministry of counseling women who were survivors of the um, what really took place in the Satanism, there was a satanic panic, but, you know, the, the Illuminati or whoever was in control was very effective in covering it all up. Because you look at 1973, I guess the, we had the, the, what was the movie The Exorcism came out. Before that, we had the Mansons in the 60s, with all the satanic activity going on with them. You look in the late 70s, the Amityville Horror came out. That book came out and scared the crap out of America. Um, so, yeah, there was a satanic panic going on about now. And this is right smack in the middle of it. So let's go dive deeper into things. So Reverend Rogers, um, how did he get in the door? So Dr. Fromm reportedly put together the group of 10 children who were not responding to any treatment. Okay, so this is the, um, the focus group, or the, the test group. 10 children put together by Dr. Fromm. The experiment was to determine if Karen's case was demonic possession. Karen was one of the children in the group. Reverend Rogers reportedly had a grift to discernment of demons. Yay, thank you. If he's going to do deliverance, he's got to be able to hear the Holy Spirit, hear God, and discern de- demonic spirits. So to launch the exorcism experiment, he, he needed to discern if there are any demonic spirits present in the group of children. So we got, what, 11 kids? 10 kids. Yeah, so we have 10 kids, so that's kind of cool. So now Reverend Rogers really has to display the gifts of the Spirit, right? So he's, he's prayed, he's been fasting for seven days. So now he walks in and he just he has to discern who has the demonic entities in him. So he lays hands on the children and then waits to hear from God. All right, this is getting cool. So far, so good. I'm with him. I'm down with this. This is not like a normal deliverance where we're just like, come out, come out. I see this and that. No, this guy's doing it right. Uh, so far, he's got some uh, good check marks for me. So Dr. Fromm knew all the children had retardation except for Karen, who was the only child presumed possessed. If Reverend Rogers picked any other child than Karen, he would have shut down the experiment immediately. So before Reverend Rogers even lays hands on the children, God gives Reverend Rogers a word of wisdom. The name of the child is Karen Kingston. Yeah, that's kind of cool. So yeah, so God's already setting this up. It's getting to be a divine appointment. Reverend Rogers starts repeating this to himself as he walks over to perform his discernment exercise. So he's repeating the name Karen Kingston. He was not given any of the names of the children. Reverend Rogers was proud to have opened his eyes after reciting her name and pointed directly at Karen. He discerned Karen out of the crowd. Wow, so right out of the starting gate, boom, it's you. You got spirits in you. So demonic spirit writing, this is what was confusing. So Robert Pelton was involved, the guy that wrote the book and who's documented this, was involved in the exorcism to analyze various spirits' handwritings. Demons are disembodied spirits, right? They are essentially disembodied evil personalities. So why have a handwriting analyst on hand? I don't get this. Not at all. This is like divination, borderline. It's just, it's just twisted. So Karen didn't have mental capacity to write, we're told by um, Pelton. Nor did she have the muscle control to write. Under various states of demonic possession, the spirits could write using her hands. In the experiments, the demons would be ordered to write. Again, this is not a very bright idea. I don't like this. This part, I don't know who came up with this. Forcing the demons to perform on command, that's what it is. Um, but it's also giving them an, uh, an outlet to, you know, <laughs> convey lies. Or, and just mess up the exorcism. So why do you give them an instrument to communicate with? I don't know. That is an infraction right there. Not to be done in any deliverance ministers. Hey, let's get them to write something. No, you bind them to shut up. You don't let them talk about anything except when they're going to leave. But, you know, it is what it is. This, this writing assignment was part of the experiment. So let's dive into the prayers of liberation, a.k.a. the, the, the what they call the exorcisms. Um, so we're on day one, Saturday, April 13th, 1974. I believe we're, we're starting at the, the clock starts at 8 a.m. Here we go. We're starting this uh, prayers of liberation now. So Pelton tells us everyone hand was skeptical of Karen being a demonic possession. The Roman Catholic priest, Father Tyson, was not convinced. Reverend Sutter, the Baptist healer, was on the fence, so he was kind of not sure what's going on here. Not completely convinced. And at this moment, only Reverend Rogers and his wife, Ruth, were convinced of the situation at hand with Karen. So Reverend Rogers starts in in the prayers of liberation. The book does use exorcism. I'm using prayers of liberation. Let's call it where it is. So again, we keep in mind, this is a charismatic exorcism. Prayers of liberation, right? Let's use those terms. And not the Roman Catholic rite of exorcism. Reverend Rogers began Karen's prayers of liberation by reading scriptures from the Bible. Okay, what do you read here? So he's reading from Luke 4, 31 through 37. Okay, so we're driving out the unclean spirit. 
So Luke 4.31, Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. They were astonished at his teachings because his message had authority. In a synagogue, there was a man with an unclean demonic spirit who cried out with a loud voice, Leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus Nazarene? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be quiet and come out. See, there it is right there. <laughs> Bind him to shut up and leave. I don't, giving him pencil is not a good idea. But anyhow, it's in scripture right there, so that backs it up. And throwing him down before the demon came out of him without hurting him at, the, at all. And amazement came all over them, and they kept saying to one another, What is this message? For he commands the unclean spirits of authority and power, and they come out. And news about him began to go out every place in the vicinity. Yeah, so that's where Jesus casts out the demon out of the man in the synagogue. Um, so Reverend Rogers always jumps over to Matthew 12. This is cited a lot too. An unclean spirit's return. Matthew 12, 43 through 45. When an unclean spirit comes out of a man, it roams through waterless places, looking for rest but doesn't find any. Then it says, I'll go back to my house that I came from. And returning it, it finds the house vacant. A.K.A. or not A.K.A. but uh, yeah. It, it finds the house vacant because the Holy Spirit isn't there. It swept and put in order. In other words, there was deliverance were made, spirits were cast out, but the Holy Spirit and Jesus did not reside in that person, so it's un, it's 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 vacant. <laughs> so these things can come back now. They come back with a vengeance. Then off it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil in itself, and they enter and settle down there. As a result, that man's last condition is worse than his first. That's how it will be also with this evil generation. So it brings back seven more spirits evil in itself it's it wasn't like hey let's go grab some more evil spirits it's like they it's kind of like gang warfare right you know the, the, the higher up gang members come back with the little ones like hey let's move in what's the next one reverend rogers used here uh, mark mark 7 25 through 30 instead immediately after hearing about him a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit came and fell at his feet now the woman was greek by birth and she kept asking him to drive the demon out of her daughter he said to her Allow the children to be satisfied first because it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. But she replied to him, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, Because of this reply, you may go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. When she came back home, she found her child lying on the bed and the demon was gone. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so he didn't have to show up for that one. Just Jesus, he's God, right? He's God incarnate. It had to be in front of it. So we have John 8, 36. Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you really will be free. So you're free, you're free indeed, right? Yep, that's true. Once God does it, you're free. Acts 16, 16 through 18. Paul and Silas in prison. Once, as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit of prediction. It's called a pythonic spirit, right? That's why everybody's, these deliverance ministers, it's a pythonic spirit, it's a pythonic spirit. You know, it's, keep in mind, um, this slave girl, she was an oracle, right? Um, this thing just didn't enter her because she was in a haunting or something. She was an oracle because she allowed herself to be possessed with a pythonic spirit. This stuff was all over the place in, um, in Ephesus. It was just crazy. So she made a large profit for owners by fortune telling, right? So it's, it's, it's a business going on here. She's possessed by a pythonic spirit and they're, they're just raking in bucks here. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, These men who are proclaiming to you the way of the salvation are the slaves of the God Most High. And she did this for many days. So it's very annoying, right? She just keeps yelling out, you know, these are the men who are proclaiming to be the way of God. God was high. And they're trying to preach and she's yelling over him. But Paul is greatly aggravated and turning to the spirit said, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out right away. I think the King James Version says in that hour it came out. I think that's more accurate. Because usually with Jesus it came out right away. Um, Paul, in that hour, it makes sense to who he was walking in life. With his faith and walk. That if he could have a really nasty spirit. This was possession. She was possessed. This wasn't a deliverance. She had subjugation. She allowed a demon, pathonic demon to come inside her. And it wouldn't just be a deliverance like, oh, I repent. No, she, this thing would have just been nasty coming out of her. And when it comes out right away, many Christians go, well, how come it didn't come out right away like I read in the Bible? Well, look what who Paul was. My gosh, you know, he, this guy was just, <laughs> he was walking in it. You know, him and Peter were just walking in this stuff. And, and many Christians aren't. We're in the, the fast food generation of the church. We want things done right away. But we don't want to work for it. We don't want to develop the relationship with Jesus to get there. And so we don't see these deliverances happen right away. Uh, many times I work with people and these demons don't come out. A lot of times I know right away it's because of where they're at. They're actually so weak in their faith um, that they can't believe the demon will leave. And they're in fear that the demon will stay and not reach, you know, not leave them. And that's why the demon hangs on even though they have no legal rights. 
It's because the only person's faith is just way down there. You know, it's very close to being a house unswept. At least they have Jesus in them, but they don't trust him. So that's an issue. Oh, this is cool one. So Philippians 2, 9 through 11 is the other thing Reverend Rogers used. Um, I love this one. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and earth and under the earth, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. <laughs> I had a funny thing happen during a ministry. Oh, it was years ago. We were dealing with this demon who was just mouthing off. And I, I, I went there with this. I said, for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name is above every name. So that every name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and earth and under the earth. And right then and there, that person in, just hit the floor, almost face down, you know. <laughs> and the demon was mouthing off, I hate Jesus, I hate Jesus, you know, doing his stuff. And just F-bombing, but it had to obey scripture. And that was one of the things that just stuck with me for the longest time, that this, this demon, as much of his mouth and off, it was face down, bowing to Jesus. Um, it was just one of those incredible things you walk away with going, wow. You know, demons know scripture. Forget all these New Agers say, like, oh, you know, this isn't real. There's many ways to heaven. Heck, no, there is. Um, it's deception. It's all deception out there. These demons know scripture. If if the Bible is useless, they wouldn't know it like they knew it, and they, they wouldn't obey it. Look at it that way. They obey it, and this, this stuff's real. It's very real. So the next thing Reverend Rogers quoted was James 4, 7 through 8. Therefore, submit to God, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and pour, purify your hearts. Double-minded people. Well, he had a lot of these here. Um, another one Reverend Rogers used, 1 Peter 3, 22. Now that he has gone to heaven, he is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. Okay, he fulfilled the cup that he drank from his father. Um, the cross was the only true atonement for mankind's sins, defeated Satan, got all authority back. So he's up at the right-hand side of the, of the father. Um, he's above angels. Remember, Satan, the highest ranking angel, is below Jesus now. So God, he's at God's right hand with angels. Jesus is. Authorities and powers subject to him. Those authorities and powers subject to him are Satan and those those angels, all the good angels, and um, the one third that fell from Satan all the way down. They're all subject to Jesus. They obey him, even though they're in rebellion. They have to obey him. So Revelation twelve seven through ten, this is a cool one. So the dragon thrown out of heaven. Then the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought. We could not prevail. There was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah have now come. Because the accuser of our brothers has been thrown out, the one who accuses them before God day and night. So, okay, so those are the, the prayers that um, Reverend Rogers started out with. Good stuff. Very good stuff. Um th- it was probably organized. Like I said, he's hearing from God. He's fasting. So he probably was directed to which prayers. So yeah, this is, I don't recommend like, oh, this is what Reverend Rogers used. That's what we do today. We're such cookie cutters. We don't want to listen to Jesus or fast. So, oh, this guy used this and it worked for him. It's got to work for us. No, he listened to God. There was probably specific reasons why God gave him these verses because whatever demons he was up against, it took authority over him. And so my, my hat's off to Reverend Rogers. This is cool. Good stuff. So a quick recap for the opening prayers. Reverend Rogers has established the authority of Jesus Christ in session of these liberation prayers. This is not an exorcism. It's prayers of liberation. Although we have a Roman Catholic priest on hand, both exorcisms and prayers of liberation are Mark 929 level ministries and not deliverance ministries as presented in Luke 10 with the return of the 70 disciples. So what do I mean by that? Why is there separation between prayers of liberation and exorcisms? The Roman Catholic exorcism is a rite. It's something that's read and it goes through step by step, right? It's a ritual. On our side of the fence, the Lutherans, on the Lutherans, um, the Lutheran side of the fence here, uh, prayers of liberation are like we're doing what Reverend Rogers is doing. We are praying, fasting. It's a prayer session. Jesus, what do you want me to do? Holy Spirit, what am I supposed to do here? And we sit back and receive and we hear from God. So one is listen to God and do what God tells you. And the other one is actually there's a ritual. It's followed through step by step. So Mark 9.29 prayer can be dangerous and escalate quickly. That's the difference between that and um, deliverance, right? Uh, that's when, when you're in 929 prayer, you start seeing people being flung around the room, people levitating, um, manifestations in the room, all sorts of stuff. 
Uh, so it's it's kind of where it's different here. Remember that um, in the Bible, Mark 9, why quote 929, even the disciples couldn't cast out the demons out of the the boy who was flinging himself in the fire, who was having the fits, and they were confused. And finally, when they got Jesus alone, like, hey, what happened? You know, and, and Jesus says, those only come out with fasting and prayer. This is a totally more intense, different warfare than deliverance. Do not confuse the two or you will get beat up. So the soul must be prepped over time and ministry by the Holy Spirit to be able to enter into these intense battles of the mind, soul, and spirit. Consider it like when you're in a Mark 929 situation, you're stepping in the ring throwing punches. And those things are going to punch back. So you must be in a position where the Holy Spirit brought you to this point, not because you thought it was exciting and you volunteered. There's two different things going on. If the Holy Spirit brought you here to fight this, he's going to protect you. If you stepped out of your, your protective covering of the Holy Spirit and you decided to take it on yourself out of pride, you'd probably get yourself beat up pretty good. So this is dealing with demonic possession and possible occult activity. I throw that in the latter part. I have some thoughts about this as to how young Karen Kingston became possessed. It doesn't add up the way they said it. I think other stuff happened in foster care that made it worse. So for example, Act 16, a slave girl was an occult situation, right? She was an oracle trained in the occult to become possessed. She invited it in. We still have people do that in um, upper state New York or something, some weird psychic um, training area out there where they go and become oracles like that and allow themselves to be possessed by their, their spirits. It's just, it's just wrong. It's so wrong on many levels. Um, there was a tragic incident recently in the news where a father in Arizona who was depraved in the mind poured boiling water down his young son's throat to expel a demon. I don't know if any of you guys recall that. Um, the news ran with an exorcism byline. It wasn't an exorcism. That was a nut kick that killed his, his son. Um, I don't know why on earth, he, you know, who in the right mind would pour boiling water down their... Uh, anybody. And I'm just, I'm just horrified that little boy would happen to him. So this is a horrible incident where a delusionally insane man became, you know, horrifically killed his son. It's, it's gross. Uh, so, yeah, it is what it is. It's leave exorcism to the ministry people. You know, don't do it. If you have... An, an, a lot of times people think they have an exorcism situation. That's what wears me out so much. I don't respond to everybody because I can't. It's, I think it's demonically done to wear us out. How many people call it, I'm possessed, I'm possessed, or I'm cursed? And it's not. It turns out to be people who just don't want to take it, um, control of their own wrong behaviors in life. So it's, it's hard to weed out. But we see with Karen Kingston, something demonically is definitely going on here. And that's what this looks like. We have possessions, this is what it looks like. Um, so we have Reverend Rogers completely reading the scriptures from his Bible and then we see that at that moment, he laid hands on Karen's head and began the battle with his demonic spirits in her. So Reverend Rogers ordered the demons to come out. Come out of her in the name of Jesus Christ. He stirred up the hornet's nest there, right? The <laughs> demon responded, This girl is mine. Go away. Go away. She belongs to me. Leave us alone. Okay. Um, when you're dealing with... I have people brought to me who had dissociations, right? And they go, well, they're talking to themselves. Got to be demonic. A dissociation will be a singular, like, I don't want to talk to you. Go away. I don't feel like talking to you, and I'll do mean things to you. I, I, I. That's a dissociation. We start hearing stuff like this, like this demon did. This girl is mine. Go away. She belongs to me. Leave us alone. We start hearing the plural. <laughs> that's when there's a little organization going on there that's not, that's not earthly, right? Um, that's kind of the key things to listen to. But does it's an indicator, but it doesn't always add up to that, right? So be very careful. You must be the biggest skeptic in the room when you see this stuff. You must be. Uh, because you're there to resolve the situation, not there to go, oh, I can cast out a demon. No, you're there to bring a resolution to the situation. Is it mental illness? Is it somebody wants attention? You know, all the above? What is it? So you have to be on guard. And it just it takes lots of discernment, and things become easier down the road of what's a demon, what's dissociation. You'll start getting used to those. But that takes a couple of years under your belt. So Reverend Rogers looked around the room at the others. They stared back at him in shock what they witnessed. Reverend Rogers took authority of the manifesting demon. What is your name? The demon responded, I don't have to tell you anything. I own this girl. She's mine, only mine. Sounds like Daffy Duck. Mine, 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 all mine. For those of you who can remember those cartoons, yeah. Mine, 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 all mine, all mine. So Robert Pelton commented on what he experienced at that moment. Her demonic response made his skin crawl. How her crossed eyes glared back with a hateful defiance at Reverend Rogers. Her stomach rumbled and she released horrible belches into the room. A foul odor of rotting flesh filled the room. The air was putrid to breathe. It's noted in the book that the Roman Catholic priest, Father John Tyson, was trembling as he tightly clenched his medallion of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in his right hand. 
Under his breath, he murmured the Lord's Prayer in Latin, the Paternoster. The stench increased as the father prayed. The author notes that um, Joyce Donaldson, one of the therapy nurses there, almost vomited. It was just so nasty. So the other nurses in the room were brought to tears from what unfolded before their eyes. So they, they're starting to see the weight of demonic oppression fill the room, right? There's manifestations going on here. So um, Pelton describes the air. There was an air of hopelessness as the forces of darkness entered the, the room of the battle. So Karen gave the reverend obscene gestures. <laughs> Get the middle finger. Now, again, the obscene gestures don't indicate a demon. It can indicate DID, you know, a dissociated part that hates um, anything um, spiritual or hates, hates Jesus because something may have happened to him involving a false Jesus or something during a ritual. So don't always assume the middle finger is a, a demon. You really have to work it. Um, if you have discernment, you can tell right away. Um, I've had people that were trying to do these um, massive dem demonic manifestations running. I'll come go, you're not a demon. And they'd sit down and laugh, go, how did you know? You're the first deliverance minister to figure this out. And I said, well, I'm not a deliverance minister. So Reverend Rogers ordered the demon to write something on paper for him. Take one of those pens and write something. I command you in the name of Jesus. The demon rebuked Rogers. Go straight to hell, preacher. You need not bother me. Leave me alone. You got rotten maggot of a preacher. At that moment, Robert Pelton noted the demon flipped off the Roman Catholic priest, Father Tyson. Okay, it's on now in the room. Here we go. And what the author described is a noticeable change in voice from Karen. I wonder if it sounded like my voice. I don't know. Just... <laughs> and hatred filled her eye as she yelled out, Aramis, Aramis, Aramis. Father Tyson was again thoroughly shaken. The demon used a Latin phrase for let us pray. So he's going, let us pray, let us pray. So he's kind of mocking the Father Tyson there. Uh-oh. I mean, that's too bad it's not Father Mike Tyson. He would have done something. Oh. Somewhere during this confrontation, um, Reverend Rogers was pressed in the spirit to start writing something for um, writing analysis of the experiment. So he's sitting there. So Reverend Rogers pressed the spirit to start writing something for the writing analysis. I don't get this. I, it just, this is mind-boggling. So Reverend Rogers used an unorthodox form of ministry that is not recommended and is non-biblical. He started calling the spirit names. On the blood of Jesus Christ, I ordered you to write something. The manifesting demon did not respond to Reverend Rogers. Obey my command in Jesus' name. Still, a demon remained silent. Can you write? What's the matter with you? Are you too stupid to write anything? The demon responded, I can certainly write if I watched you. I am a genius. Rogers taunted. Prove to me you're a genius. I don't have to prove you anything, you idiot. The demon replied. Rogers prodded back. You're much too stupid to write. The manifesting demon and Karen grabbed the pen and started to write. There, you pitiful idiot. The demon snarled as it put the pen down. Just, just what the hell do you think this is, you friggin' idiot? Rogers handed Pelton the paper for writing analysis. All the medical staff in the room were astonished. Karen was labeled as retarded, right? So now she's mentally incapable of writing anything. So she's writing this stuff down. So something quirky's coming up. So at this point, I want to inject some of my ministry comments about Reverend Rogers. His tactics of provoking the demon, um, which in biblical terms is known as reviling an angelic spirit, is not an acceptable approach for engaging demons or satanic angels. I know we see it on TV a lot by the experts. I'm using my quotation finger marks there. Um, you don't revile demons. They're, they're satanic angels. Um, go look up um, Jude 8 through 10. So actually, I'll look it up for you. So, nevertheless, these dreamers likewise defile their flesh, reject authority, and blasphemous gloria ones. So, glorious ones are also called majestic majesties. We're talking about um, some of the higher up satanic angels in the second heavens, um, not the ones that come down here. But still, the, um, you don't, demons are still the are low order, you know, fallen angels here. So, you don't revile them. Yet, Michael the archangel, when he was disputing with the devil in a debate about Moses' body, did not dare bring an abusive con condemnation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme anything they don't understand. What they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, they destroy themselves with these things. Woe to them, for they have traveled in the way of Cain, have abandoned themselves the heir of Balaam for profit, and have perished in Korah's rebellion. So what is that looking to? Um... But these people blast me anything they don't understand. That's the paranormal investigators out there right now. We see Zach Beggins in these shows. Are you talking to me? I'm not afraid of you. I'm, I'm not afraid of demons. You know, come on, come get me. You know, that's that's reviling angelic majesties. Or, you know, even these are low, low order demonic demons. But these people blast me anything they don't understand. These guys aren't experts on TV. Um, they just aren't. So woe to them, right? They have traveled the way of Cain, have abandoned themselves of error, 
of Balaam for profit, right? Remember what Balaam did? <laughs> Same thing. He's got to sell it for profit. Wow. So the correct approach to engaging the dark forces is for the Lord to rebuke them. I know we see in Ghost Adventures again, so Zach Bagans are pridefully taunting demonic spirits. Jude, the book of Jude is referring to reviling dark angelic majesties like satanic principalities and dark ruling angels. The demonic are low-level satanic fallen angels, right? They're still angels. What Rogers is doing is foolishly stepping out of his bounds of authority and inviting satanic attacks. He is incapable of thwarting, right? So sickness, oppression, terminal illness, possession, also all the above. Um, so he's stepping out of the covering of God. God says, do not revile these things. Rebuke them. See, in the Lord, in the name of the Lord, rebuke you. So a better approach for Reverend Rogers would have been, the Lord rebuke you. In the authority of Jesus Christ, you will obey his commands, pick up the paper and write. I mean, it's, if I was back then, that's how I probably would have done it. I still wouldn't have made them write anything. That just bothers me. In actuality, I wouldn't have had them write because now we're spirit writing, right? So I don't understand why Reverend Rogers allowed this. It just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, pretty soon this book gets popular. We'll see the, the paranormal guys doing this. Pick up the pen. That's the same thing I'm doing with the flashlight, right? Turn the flashlight on and off. Turn the flashlight on and off. Same thing. So um, in other words, so he was asking in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to use your witchcraft, right? That's what, he, that's what he's doing. That's why we can't use this stuff. Does it make sense? Uh, anyway, they got the writing sample from the spirit they wanted for a loosely defined experiment of what they were doing, right? So was this an experiment or an exorcism? I don't know. It's confusing and awkward. Very puzzling. And why was a Catholic priest on hand? His diocese cardinal will not allow him to be there, right? For to play second fiddle to even to a Presbyterian minister or even approved his, his presence to be there. Lots of questions. Was Did the cardinal approve of the Catholic priest to do an exorcism? That has to go through Mary Chains of command too. Uh, was he just there hanging out to be part of the prayer ministry? I don't know. Because... Uh, a Catholic ritual of exorcism must be approved high up. You just can't start doing one. Okay, now back to the events at hand in prayer session. Again, we open the Rogers reviling demonic spirit. You don't even know your own name, shouted Rogers, right? My name's Williams. Everyone here knows. Even you should know who I am. So, so again, I want to interject. Um, dealing with demons is weird. They're disembodied spirits. This one calls itself Williams. Sometimes they make up these weird names and lie to you because they don't want to be cast out. Other times they may be the person, it may be generational who did, who they entered through, you know, generationally or somewhere else when the demon gained access and they'll take on that person's name. Um, weak demons give weird names like Williams. And if they're really, really low, they lie to you and tell you like Lucifer or Satan. It just cracks me up. You know, you hear <laughs> like you're the one or two demons in there's a lot of demons side person you're, you're working with and they start calling themselves Lucifer or Satan. You'll know you're not. And they start insisting they are. It's just they're liars, right? If they, It's to break your spirit in the fight. Oh my gosh, I'm a good Satan. I can't do this. You know, it's a lie. They lie. Oh my gosh, they lie. They have the language of lies. So when Rogers asked how long the demonic spirit was in the girl, it said, quite a long time. In demonic speak, we're probably looking at a generational spirit, right? In this scene, we have Reverend Rogers, his wife, Sister Ruth, jump in to expel demons. These are weak demons. They start plea bargaining with Sister Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> they get through this. I got it happen before too. I wasn't even the one causing the problems. Don't cast me out. You know, they start plea bargaining to a low level, right? They look all terrifying until you get to them. And you, you, once you get past that and use your authority, they're petrified of leaving. So um, when they're plea bargaining, this is a uh, common in deliverance ministry scenarios, again, with low level demons. Um, in the book, Sister Ruth's spiritual engagement turns into a physical confrontation with a demon um, with Williams, named Williams. Karen flings her weak body through the air and knocks down Sister Ruth like a bowling pin, right? So <laughs> he just flies through the air and boom! So this is like a 60-pound little girl, right? She's, she's a, uh, like anorexic, no eating. Her eyes are crossed. She's weak. She's limping. She can't walk. Joints are messed up. She walks like a hag. Here she goes sailing through the air and knocks down Sister Ruth. So Robert Pelton describes the air in the room becoming dry and very warm like the desert. Karen is on the floor convulsing with foam coming out of her mouth. The demon began to give out moans. It was leaving. Sister Ruth laid hands on Karen's stomach and continued in prayer warfare. Go get her, Sister Ruth. Go get her. Rogers ordered the demon to leave in the name of Jesus Christ. So Williams groaned loudly and then departed from Karen's body. One hour and 45 minutes of prayer's liberation, the first miracle of God manifested. The demon Williams was expelled and instantly, oh, this is cool, so instantly Karen's hair turned from the string old hag gray to being healthy and shiny. It was the first miracle. Okay, huh? 
I want to stop here and make a comment. I wasn't at this prayer session, right? So, but from my past experience in ministry, I have some questions about this incident. Some red flags kind of here. Um, when the first demons leave, they are usually very low-level demons. Many times they're so low-level that the higher-level demons punt on them just to make it look like um, demons left, right? So they'll start kicking out the little ones. This is common. When you get the first demons to go, it's always low-level ones. They're just like, oh my gosh, they punted me. That was mean. Um, so it makes it looks like the demons left. But to an ex, you know, to an inexperienced warfare minister, oh, it left. We're done. You don't typically get a healing miracle this early in the game. There is usually a nasty root spirit involved and in, in a heavy clash in shoes before you get these miracles like this. So I, I'm curious what you know what happened here. So we have a bunch of demons in her, and the first demon leaves. All of a sudden, her hair is restored. I don't know. Maybe it did. I don't know. I wasn't there. It's just, it just from what I've seen, it doesn't usually happen this quick. So when the higher level or root demon is expelled, it leaves and takes the curse of the body with it. Um, so it, like I said, it was a higher level demon, not the lower ones. So this is just odd to me. I just throw this information out there. Maybe it was a diversion to make the ministers think that Karen was fully delivered, a bluff. I don't know. The miracle doesn't make sense to me at this early point in the game. And it could have been too, you know, they spent the week fasting, so it just we, you know, wore them down. Maybe more than one got punted here um, than just William. Maybe there are other demonic spirits attached to William that left. And one of them did this. I don't know. So who knows? Anyhow, we go through the story. And the first spirit's been expelled. William, see ya. And we're at Saturday at 08.45 a.m. So that the first team is expelled within 45 minutes. Wow. All right, team. Way to go. Very cool. Saturday, 8.45 a.m., the spirit Williams was expelled by this prayer team. And they took a little break, got their smokes out, smoke them if you got them, take a relaxation, but they're back on the job again at Saturday at 9 o'clock a.m. 15 minute break. So during the break, the Roman Catholic priest, um, Father John Tyson, requested to lead the next session of prayers of liberation. Hmm, interesting. Keep in mind, um, there are little details providing us outlining the prerequisites for these ministers accomplished to be here on site, right? So was Father Tyson cleared for rite of exorcism to do this right now? We don't know. So I think he's just sticking to probably some like deliverance prayers or something right now. Anyhow, he's getting a bold twitch in him to go after some demons here. Okay, so here we go. Again, at this point, it doesn't sound like he was given permission from his diocese at this point to do the rite of exorcism. So again, Tyson will be operating in the capacity of a, a prayer of liberation minister, probably doing deliverance prayers, as are um, Reverend Rogers and Sister Ruth and Reverend Sutter. So let's see here. So Father John opens the session with the Roman Catholic prayers of protection um, to the prayers of Archangel Michael. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him. We humbly pray and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. So we know at this point, too, the, the, the prayer for protection, to, um, the Catholic prayer for um, protection from Michael the Archangel, the prayer stirred some demonic manifestation in Karen. Hmm, we're off the bat right again. Here comes another one. Apparently, everyone in the room could feel this manifestation. And right off the bat, the evil spirit speaks. Karen's no fun to be with anymore. Leave us alone. Then this demon hurled a vase across the room at Father Tyson. He caught it in his arms where it began to vibrate. Father Tyson let go of the vase and it levitated in front of him. Wow, it's levitating right there in midair in front of him. Then it flung around the room and then crashed in the wall. Reverend Rogers jumped in. What's your name? The evil spirit retorted, I won't. I won't. You can't make me tell me my name. Rogers continued in battle. You are powerless in the name of Jesus Christ. And what is your name? Under the authority of Jesus Christ, the spirit revealed to Rogers its name. I am Linus. At this moment, Linus was compelled again to have the spirit right on paper for him. <laughs> again, why? Why, why, why? Uh, don't ever do this, guys. Um, the spirit writing is one of these red flags, right? Um, so obviously our Catholic priest received no training whatsoever in exorcism, right? Because they wouldn't have had him do this. This is crazy. So, and Reverend Rogers should know that information that comes from these fallen spirits, whatever is spoken or written, it's all lies. At that moment, the spirit calling itself Linus wrote on paper some information about a, a young, beautiful black woman nurse who apparently had a voluptuous figure named Peggy who was on staff in the room. The spirit revealed out loud promiscuous secrets about her premarital life. 
Spirit also commented on the nurse's anatomy and breasts. Rogers finally told Lying Spirit to shut up. <laughs> what do you expect? Oh my gosh. Duh. Hey, I'll write something here. Make it be nice. They're, de they're demons, dude. During this confrontation between Rogers and Linus, a picture hanging on the wall crashed to the floor. And then another picture violently broke loose from its hangings and was hurled to the floor. The glass shattered with the impact to the floor. Then a weird heavy pounding noise was heard. The couch in the corner of the room was bouncing up and down on the floor by itself. The couch became momentarily still on the ground. And then the cushions of the couch started to levitate. Karen, inattentive to the events going on in the room, sat quietly in her chair. The demon manifested again in Karen. So, you think you've got power? What do you think of that? You haven't anything yet, Buster. Now watch this. Right before their eyes, the demon turned Karen's complexion to fiery red. As quickly as that occurred, blisters broke out all over Karen's body. Her body was radiating with heat that could be felt in the room. Father Tyson approached Karen with his holy water and doused her with it. It sizzled and dissipated into steam in midair, never touching Karen. Dr. Pershing rushed in with his IVAC thermometer. Karen ran 94.5 Fahrenheit. She should have been shivering and freezing at this body temperature, but her body was radiating heat. The doctor thought for sure he would get a thermometer reading well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. He feared she would be suffering brain damage from this intense heat. Linus manifested again and spoke. Well, all of you are holier than thou, presumptuous so-called Christians. Can you get your god fight and defeat one of our so powerful as my master? Linus concluded his taunt and demonic laughter filled that room. Father Tyson started reading from a document that outlined a simple rite of exorcism to curb the power of the devil and prevent him from doing any harm. Tyson opened his protection prayer again with the Saint Michael the Archangel. Linus let out a diabolical laughter and the paper of the simple rite of exorcism Tyson was holding just burst into flames. That ridiculous garbage won't work on me. You should know better than those are just fancy words, meaningless vulgarities. Don't they teach anything in those seminaries? Reverend Rogers interrupted the pointless diatribe of Linus. Okay, you made your point. Karen's body tensed up in response. The spirit knew what was coming next. Rogers instructed all the ministry team to lay hands on Karen. Her complexion was still red, but her skin was cold and clammy to the touch. The ministry team, Reverend Sutter, Sister Ruth, and Reverend Rogers all began to pray. Come out of her in the name of Jesus. On the blood of Jesus, depart. The team repeatedly prayed this for nearly ten minutes straight. Rogers commanded, I command you in the power vested in me by Jesus Christ to come forth this instant. As the others laid hands on Karen's head, Reverend Rogers placed his Bible at the base of her neck. The spirit seemed emotionless and dormant as they usually do when they're trying to trick the ministry into believing they've been expelled. Rogers commanded the demon over and over to leave Karen. Suddenly, a deep guttural sounds were forcefully released from Karen's mouth, and she gagged as a demon was leaving her. The demon resisted and bounced her up and down in her chair. You're hurting me, the demon pleaded. In a matter of seconds, Linus was cast out. The room became supernaturally quiet, and there was peace. The blisters that were all over Karen's body had miraculously vanished as Linus was expelled. The second demon was cast out, and it was now 11.10 a.m. This episode of Tales of Glory is brought to you by our sponsor, M16 Train Series of Field Guide Spiritual Warfare and The Dog Under My Desk. Help us keep the lights on in the M16 bunker by purchasing copies of our training series books, A Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare, and its complimentary book, An Advanced Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare. Available where all fine books are sold, Amazon.com, and from fieldguidetospiritualwarfare.com or at afieldguidetospiritualwarfare.blogspot.com. And now I want to have a quick blurb from our um, interview we had several years ago with uh, Kenan Farrah Deal on Demonology Today about a field guide of spiritual warfare to help you guys get a grasp of what the book's about. Thank you very much and enjoy. God bless. This book covers just about anything you want to know about the authority, the apostolic authority. It will dispel myths and it's going to make you think about a few things that you might have not thought before. You might be Catholic. You might be Lutheran. This book we recommend to any and everybody, denomination or not, if you're mm -hmm. interested in your ability to serve God the Almighty, spiritual warfare, 
this book is for you. The things in here are powerful. You know, we, I mean, because I'm telling you, I mean, the, what you cover in this book, okay, as you know, Ken and I are authors and we cover a lot of things from the sacramental and, but you cover from the beginning of time, from original sin to things that people don't even think about, their dream states, you know, their family curses. Things that people don't even, they take for granted that, oh, well, I've had five sex partners before I was married, so what? So, you know, we're going to try and get into as much as we can on the book, but I'd really like to start with what was your inspiration to sit down and do the research and make this book happen? I guess initially it was a book I wrote for myself out of frustration. Um, I'm, I'm not in a Catholic church, so we don't have exorcists. Mm-hmm. And so the the knowledge of spirituality is really limited to what they have in seminary and what the PhDs have learned through theology. Yes. Yeah. So when I stepped into, you know, was drafted into this seeing the demonic, uh, my pastor really couldn't help me. And at first I was really frustrated with him. Um, but as I, the Holy Spirit worked with me, he goes, hey, your, your pastor is a shepherd. I'm bringing you into warfare and I'm going to train you to deal with this stuff. And you're the ones to deal with this and equip other people. Um, so it was a sharp learning curve. Um, from day one, um, as you asked me earlier, how did I get into this? Um, it, it started with um, marriage intervention, my wife and I in our church. We didn't know it, but through marriage intervention, we came to contact with several families that had demonized spouses. Um, and the church didn't understand it. And we saw full-on manifestations. Um, wow. And get your copies of A Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare and Advanced Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare today. And now back to our regularly scheduled program. It's always kind of odd looking at the names these spirits choose. I mean, like the the name like Linus reminds you of the peanuts, right? Dun 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 dun. It's like what an earth i don't know it's supposed to not be such a timid name or i don't know it's just it's weird absolutely weird yeah it's mind-boggling this whole world spiritual world so um we've expelled one two demons now it's 11 10 a.m it was saturday the the spirit named linus is gone so it looks like there was a probably a minor break or something again here and our ministry team starts up again saturday at 12 40 p.m this is now three hours and 18 minutes into the prayers of liberation so Reverend Richards resumes the prayers of liberation. It appears it was a 50-minute break, um, possibly lunch break. I don't know. Was it catered? What sort of food did they have? You know, I don't know. Was it Papa John's? Would they get pizzas? I don't know. Well, we'll see here. Um, but now it's time for the prayers to resume. Immediately, another evil spirit manifested. Wow, what caused this? Karen appeared nauseated and ready to vomit. A sultry female voice came forth from her lips. Oh, man, I got to do a female demon voice? No, forget it. Forget it. <laughs> I'm just going to go. Just, just pretend she's a demon, all right? A uh, female demon. You're making me sick. Please stop. I'm going to puke. Rogers laid one hand on Karen's head and placed the open Bible under her nose. Karen spit at Rogers. What was described as a green, stenchy goo fell under Rogers' Bible. Ugh. The demon flung foul-mouthed slanders at Rogers. The demon started singing a soft rendition of Onward Christian Soldiers. <laughs> it started out as a gentle, but... But then the demon sang it louder and louder in a mocking display of worship. Covering his ears, Rogers commanded the demon to be still in the name of Jesus Christ. The singing stopped. Rogers ordered the unclean spirit to depart from Karen. Now the spirit mocked Rogers. You leave, you puny little rent. I command you to leave in my master's name. Then the spirit irreverently recited scripture from Mark 16. Oh, they have to go there. Seriously, leave my stuff alone. (laughs) Okay, here we go. I don't want to do that. Let's do it anyway. And my Lord and Master, Lucifer, said unto me, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel of hell to every creature. Karen ceased her demonic recount to Mark and grabbed a pen and started writing on a piece of paper. Rogers asked the spirit why they wrote on paper. He didn't command to write anything. It answered, You told Linus and Williams to write, so why shouldn't I? Karen then threw the pen to the floor and stood up with alligator tears in her eyes. Then she became increasingly violent. She then lunged at Sister Ruth, pushing Rogers out of her way. Ruth and Karen fell to the floor. Karen flailed around on top of Sister Ruth. The three ministers, Rogers, the big portly Sutter, (laughs) and Father Tyson, separated the two and pulled them apart from one another. It took the strength of all three men to pin Karen to the floor. Karen was 63 pounds, Tyson was 203, and Sutter, he's our portly 298 pounds, man, 300 pounds. Pelton reported in his account that nearly 300 pounds Sutter laid his body across Karen's mid-torso to pin her. 
This little frail body was resisting the liberation prayers as she flailed about. Rogers kneeled on the ground behind her and held her hands. He continued his prayer to expel the evil spirit. Damn you! Damn all of you! I'm not coming out! I'm moved in and I'm staying! I've taken over! The evil spirit reviled. Then the spirit continued with the diatribe. You rotten, no good Jesus freaks! Then the frame of con conversation switched drastically and Karen stopped physically struggling. Karen turned her head and winked at one of the people in the room. She spoke calmly. Gosh, you've all been so nice to me. I'm glad you decided to bring me here and help me. I love you all so much. You can let me up now. It's all over. Elizabeth is gone. Pelton writes that Pastor Sutter and Father Tyson glanced over at Reverend Rogers with puzzled glares. Fortunately, Reverend Rogers, this wasn't his first rodeo. He knew the evil spirit was attempting to deceive them into believing that it had been expelled. Okay, guys, this is common. You get two or three spirits out and everything goes calm in the room. Don't trust it. It's uh, another deception tool, right? It's it's the spirits going, hey, we're all gone. Everything's cool now. That's what the spirit was doing. But it was still a manifestation, right? So the spirit manifested once more in Karen. Her face was described as being demonically filled with spite. The demon spoke. So you imbeciles want to play a game, huh? Well, hold on tight, you loosely evil perverted things. I'm going to show you a thing or two. Karen's body became tense and rigid. At the moment, she started to levitate off the ground. The demon suspended her body five feet in the air. Remember, Tyson and Sutter were pinning Karen's body to the ground. They were pulled in the air with her. Karen weighed in about 63 pounds, and we had Sutter's about 300, and we have uh, was Tyson's about 200, um, so we're, we got about 500 pounds. So she's pulling about 700 pounds in the air. This, this isn't some light feat here. <laughs> Again, this reminds me of um, the pretty much uh, Zach Bagan's Demon House with a little boy doing the Spider-Man crawl up the wall um, for protective services. Pelton reported that both um, Porter and Sutter held on for dear life for about seven minutes. Okay, so Rogers isn't holding on. <laughs> and um, um, so Pelton reports that both Tyson and Sutter are holding on for their dear life for about seven minutes since so this levitating incident took place. Why didn't Rogers bind the demon to not levitate? Um, see, there's just weird things here where Rogers, Reverend Rogers takes um, authority over things and he doesn't take authority over other things. That's some kind of wishy-washy here and what's going on. Maybe he's just freaked out with the levitation, but for seven minutes, come on, dude, there's just something here that's not right. I don't, that's why I flip-flop back and forth is, is this a real account? Because if Rogers was experienced as they, they say he was, he would have stopped a lot of this. He would have stopped the levitation. Um, I do it in authority of Jesus Christ. I command you not to levitate. Sit on the ground, sit on your hands. You're bound to the chair or bound to the floor. And that's how you do it. So wow, you know, it's 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 crazy. I don't understand the situation again why the, the minister team allowed the demon to demonstrate its power of levitation and witchcraft for seven minutes. Um yeah, something's off here. So, um out of three ministers, not one of them um, thought to order the name of Jesus Christ put us down. Under the authority of Jesus, you're never to use levitation prayer session ever again. That's what I'd use, right? You can't use it in this room. That would have ended demonic power encounter with witchcraft. That's what this was. The demon was using this to gain the upper hand in the fight. So something about this whole scene here is, I guess it's unsettling to me. I just don't see it. Um, I don't know if this is fictitious or it actually happened. So it's things like this that's like, uh, I don't know. So it seems contrived for maybe it seems contrived for sensationalizing the story. Uh, you know, did it? I don't know. Wasn't there. I wasn't there. So I have to give a disclaimer. But to me, it's a red flag of the experience of like this, this ministry minister like Rogers as to why he would permit the display of um, mocking Jesus using levitation. What I mean by mocking Jesus using levitation, remember Jesus walked on water and he would try to get Peter to do it too. Um, everything the demons do, it's mocking of Jesus. So the levitation is a mocking of Jesus walking on water. So I stopped this sort of behavior immediately in the name of Jesus Christ, you are bound. You'll submit to the commander of the Lord's army, Jesus Christ. I bind you from levitating anymore in Jesus name. Again, this is a, a component of the story I'm not sure about, but I wasn't there, uh, my disclaimer. Now, while Karen's levitating, Rogers orders a demon to come forth. The evil spirit replies, I am Satan. I am the prince of darkness. <laughs> right? There it is, right? A weak demon. Um, Low-level demons always say this. It's it's to throw off the ministry. So Satan is the highest satanic angel in, in um, the hierarchy, right? It's the highest evil satanic angel. He won't be possessing a little girl. So yeah, there's a uh, punk low-level demon spouting off with stuff, right? The <laughs> demon continued, Remove your hands from this child's head. Repair to suffer the consequences. Remove them now. The demon responded by hurling Karen's levitating body at Rogers and striking him in the chest and knocking him down. Whoa. The demon started to violently shake Karen's bodies as it irritably floated in the air. It was strong enough sharp jerks to break the grips of Father Tyson and Pastor Sutter off her and fling them to the ground. 
Well, that's crazy. Father Tyson was able to get back to his feet, but Sutter was KO'd. Right? Ding! Sutter's out. Karen continued to float upwards, only being stopped by the ceiling of the room. Her head kept hitting the ceiling like a demon was trying to float through it. It was recorded that the, this lasted for 10 minutes. So now we got Karen levitating the ceiling, banging her head for 10 minutes. Um, again, as to why the ministers don't take authority or levitation at this time, it's mind-boggling. Is it for the sensationalization of the story? I don't know. I can't believe these ministers would permit this. I have some problems with credibility in the story when we see events like this. Rogers was described as an experienced deliverance minister, which means he shouldn't or wouldn't tolerate any displays or powers of witchcraft like this. Strange. Again, what's the credibility of the story? I don't know. It is what it is, huh? So let's just go through it. After 10 minutes, Karen's body fell to the floor and began to violent shake from a demon-induced seizures. Her body shook uncontrollably in the demon's control. She shouted out profanities. This is looking a lot like the demon that possessed count of uh, Mark chapter 9, right? The boy that throws himself in the fire, the boy shook violently. It's looking a lot like that. Karen kicked, shook with supernatural strength, and blasphemies filled the air. Her hair was statically charged and stood on ends. The demon shouted out Bible verses, interjected with profanities. Dr. Pershing stepped into Karen's BP, so he's taking her blood pressure, right? So Dr. Pershing steps in, takes her Karen's blood pressure. The demon mockingly lets Pershing approach her and take her blood pressure readings. The spirit calling itself Elizabeth taunted Dr. Pershing. Well, good doctor, what is your diagnosis? Do you even have one? Give me the benefit of your learned mind and your scholarly background. The demon let out shrills of agony, freaking out everyone in the room. Reverend Rogers and his wife, Ruth, resumed warfare prayer and petitioning Jesus to deliver the child. Again, I'm interjecting my thoughts. Why weren't the commanding the spirit identify itself as Elizabeth to re leave and never return, right? That's what um, happens in Mark 9, leave and never return by Jesus. I see the spirits identifying itself as Elizabeth because um, that may not be the spirit's real name. Remember, um, earlier it identified itself as Satan. These are lying spirits. It's their nature. In ministry, I bind them to their nature, right? And her nature's lying. In any event, I'm curious about this entire deliverance up to this point, right? So what I would do is I... In the name of Jesus Christ, I bind the spirit that is now identifying itself as Elizabeth. You are bound. That's how you bind it, right? Um, doesn't have to be its real name, but the, it, by its nature, it's identifying itself as that. There's nothing new under the sun here. I mean, the, the stuff I'm talking about here, binding demons, was used by Derek Prince and Lester Summerall. I mean, these are the champions of the deliverance ministry, right? So what gives here? These guys were around for Reverend Rogers, so he would have had this information on hand. I don't know. It, it, it all seems so odd, right? So why any of this is allowed to persist in, in ministry like it did, I don't know. Reverend Rogers tried to get Karen's soul to surface to get her to accept Jesus. Okay, so like um, what he's talking about here, you know, I, I'm calling Karen back up. Karen, come up. I bind the demons and Karen to come up. But he doesn't say they did this, right? Um, that's just how you would do it. I'm requesting Karen to come up. That's what I would do. She was too weak at this moment. And the spirit calling itself Elizabeth prevented this from happening. He asked, Karen, do you want to be free of these spirits? The demonic spirit replied, Let me think about that. A short pause. He asked, Karen, do you want to be free of these spirits? The demonic spirit replied, Let me think about that. A short pause. No, I don't want to get rid of my friends. I love my family. They give me power. Why should I make them leave? Rogers fired back. You can't speak for Karen. I challenge you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I command you to leave the body of Karen. Sister Ruth and Pastor Sutter joined in the warfare. Come out of her for Jesus. Come out of her for Jesus. The ministers said they could feel the power shift in the room. They were winning. They continued their vocal prayer for about 10 minutes in the room. The voice of Elizabeth changed to a terrified demeanor. It was losing the battle. I'm going. I'm going. I can't take any more. It's unbearable in here. I'm leaving. I can't take any more garbage. Pelton noted that 3.58 p.m. The spirit left quietly. The team felt a rest in, in order, but there was no time for it. It noted that the spirit left quietly. Many times spirits come out through choking or coughing, but not always. So yeah, we have the spirit that, that leaves quietly. So in um, deliverance ministries, it's always put in the book, oh, they'll cough them out. You know, no, that's not always true. They could, they could just leave quietly. Many times they come as they entered. Um, and sometimes they might um, <laughs> pass gas. That's how they came in, right? I don't want to go there how that happened, but you know what I'm saying? So don't always think they always have to cough out. It's just you you, you have to use your discernment that it leave. Um, and if it's gone. So Reverend Rogers' ministry team here was dead on with their spiritual discernment. 
Um, no pun intended there. They're dead on. Very few ministers take the time to understand this gift of um, discernment. It needs to be there. Not all deliverance ministers have this gift. Sorry, it is what it is. God gives us different gifts. Not everybody has it. That's what the problem with deliverance ministry running rapid right now is that a lot of people say they have the gift and they don't. It's kind of sad. So it, it makes for a bogus deliverance ministry where people are actually lying and faking. It is what it is, man. Be careful where you go. I have seen on occasion when a minister said they, they, they saw a spirit leave when no one else felt it or detected it, when in fact the spirit didn't leave at all, right? I've seen this. A demon can hijack a minister in their ministry through this, you know, through their pride. Be very careful. Uh, be careful of prideful ministers in your midst. Sadly, there are lots of them out there. So where are we at now? Okay, so we're at Saturday, uh, 13th of April, 1974. We're at 3.58 p.m. Two hours, 34 minutes into the exorcism. There was no break between expelling the spirit of Elizabeth to the moment when Reverend Rogers discerned the presence of another spirit manifesting. Wow, so they put one, here comes another one. The atmosphere of the air filled with a sense of smoking evil presence. A horrible stench immediately filled the air. The evil spirit manifesting in Karen stared back at the ministry with the glossy glare of the next demon. Rogers tried to speak to the soul of Karen but got a response. He then laid hands on her. The demon remained silent and maintained its cold evil stare. So when you see these stares, it's you know, a lot of times on TV they always have these black eyes, like black eyed kids. You know, it's a demon. That's not how it looks. It's really a weird, like, um, glassy eyed, red eyed doll looking back at you. If that makes any sense, like a little bit of bloodshot. It's just glary and glassy and just a cold stare. It's like something other than the person staring back at you, but the same eye color. If that makes sense. And there's just a weird, ugh, ugly feeling to it. Um, so that's what they're seeing. So as described next is that Karen spoke in evil utterances. Karen's lips didn't move, but the demon spoke from inside her. It's kind of like a ventriloquist dummy. Ew, crazy. Tell me about sin, preacher boy, it mocked. Rogers commanded the spirit to identify itself. The spirit responded, I am Wellesley. That is W-E-L-L-E-S-L-E-Y. <laughs> it spells its name out. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. The spirit turned its attention to Father Tyson and called him out by name. When Rogers had the opportunity, he interrupted the spirit's tirade on Father Tyson. I thought you never knew Father Tyson. Are you a liar? The spirit became angry at Reverend Rogers. Who are you calling a liar? I don't know that brainless Catholic jerk. The spirit continued. We're not afraid of those creeps. A few maybe, but Tyson and the likes of him, an absolute empathic no. It's crazy the dialogue these things have when it comes to these words. An absolute empathic no. I don't know. The spirit then turns attention from Father Tyson and glared at everyone in the room. I'm stronger than all of you. In that instant, Karen looked over at Nurse Carol Peterson and then pounced her. The witness described that Karen acted like a rabid animal and mauled the nurse. Wow, she flew through here and pounced her. Karen used her hands like claws and scraped Carol's face. She landed on Carol and violently attacked her. Karen ripped open Carol's blouse and tore at her bra, fleeing it through the air. Carol's blood was on her torn clothes. She couldn't fight Karen off of her. That's how much strength this girl has right now. 63-pound girl, and they can't fight her off. That's crazy. Karen clawed away Carol and sunk her teeth into Carol's chest. It took seven people to pull Karen off Carol, who was so badly beaten she was now unconscious. Finally, Rogers took authority of the demon and commanded, In the name of Jesus be still. The spirit, calling itself Wellesley, immediately stopped this ravenous attack in composure. The demon was fixated on the fact that it had violently mauled Carol and boasted about it. Rogers worked to divert the spirit's attention and asked it to write something on paper. Here we go again. Wesley's spirit turned its attention to Father Tyson and then began to mockingly write prayer in Latin. Then the spirit started praying the Lord's Prayer of the Paternoster in Latin. This eerie recitation was very disturbing to Father Tyson. Yeah, I'd find it disturbing too. Now you know you got something wicked and crazy going on. It's, it's doing the, the Father's Prayer in Latin. Wesley picked the pencil and started drawing on paper as a demon taunted Tyson with mocking Latin prayers. The evil spirit started singing Latin as it finished a couple of sketches. The demon could see that Rogers was not impressed. Reverend Rogers stayed in mental prayer the whole time, hearing from God. Rogers st started praying out loud, and this disturbed Wellesley. The unclean spirit directed his attention away from Tyson and onto Rogers as he was praying. Wellesley mocked Rogers' prayers. The spirit didn't like Rogers and how he stayed in his spiritual authority. Yes, yeah, so this guy's the spirit's trying to the spirit's trying to mess with the spiritual atmosphere there, and then Reverend Rogers staying in mental prayer, just you know, talking to Jesus, hearing from him. Do this, do this, listening to the Holy Spirit. Apparently that upset the spirit. I wonder why. It's getting tactical information now to get rid of him.
See, this is why these these little books, notebooks, and classes you take aren't really effective. They're great to um, give you an idea of what's going on, but you can't use notebooks or anything like that. These little books people write are the um, How to Root Demon Prayers. Those books, they're useless, useless in battles like this. You have to be like Reverend Rogers, listening to Holy Spirit. What, what do we do next? That's how you get rid of these things. Remember, these are eternal beings. They, they, they have, um, they've been around long before man, and they know how to um, deal with us and mess with us. The only way to battle them is to talk to the Holy Spirit. That's it, period. So leave your root, rooting demons books at home. It's not going to help you. Sorry, it is what it is. So Tyson took his crucifix and placed it right in front of Karen's face. The priest recited in Latin, Our help is in the name of the Lord. Wellesley laughed at the priest. The demonic spirit and Tyson exchanged volleys at each other in Latin. <laughs> Here we go. Then Father Tyson invoked his authority in the name of Christe, Latin for Christ. The spirit was said to have gone immediately silent and pulled Karen's face away from the crucifix. Something strange and powerful was taking place. Something powerful and good. The movement of the Holy Spirit came crashing through. Father Tyson having utterances of the Holy Spirit. Wow, the dude's speaking in tongues. Here we go. He is speaking in tongues against a demon. It is noted in the book that Father Tyson did not possess the gift of tongues at this point in ministry. Yeah, here we go. See, guys? See what it is? You have to move in the supernatural. Um, leave your books at home. I used to do that in early phases of ministry. I'd, I'd practically bring my library with me for, for you know early um, demonic sessions. And the only thing I bring me now is just the Bible. Now I don't even have to know where I'm going to look in the Bible because the Holy Spirit's going to tell me. So just bring your Bible. You know, you could use your phone, but, you know, the demon may suck the power of your phone. So they can't suck the power of the, uh, a, a printed book. So bring that instead. So here we go. <laughs> Father Tyson speaking in tongues, which um, some Catholics weren't charismatic. This would freak him out and say, oh, that's of the devil. It's not here. Check this out. Sir Rogers commented, he's got the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is moving in this room. <laughs> yes, he is. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's got the Holy Ghost. Sister Ruth started quoting uh, 1 Corinthians 14.2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh unto no man, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, he speaketh mysteries. Yeah, so Father Tyson's just totally got the other end of the Holy Spirit going on here. That's cool. Taking on the, um, the smart off little demon who speaks Latin. Not anymore. Can't speak Holy Spirit angelic. It's going to take him on. Our evangelist healer. Pastor Sutton was well accustomed with tongues and broke out with his utterances of the Holy Spirit with Father Tyson. The four ministers fell under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, here we go. They held hands with one another and prayed in their prayer languages of tongues. The utterances of the prayer and the movement of the Holy Spirit moved the ministry team for 15 minutes. So they're going out in tongues for 15 minutes. Yeah, here we go. This thing doesn't stand a chance. I had um, my first, uh, one of my first uh, ministry experiences in prayer i started praying in tongues with a, a manifesting demon and it just came up and goes i hate that blank you know it hated it it was just shrieking from like stop it stop it so there's the tongues has power when you do this sort of thing you better be baptized in the holy spirit um people are going why well, don't have to be baptized in the bible but if you're taking on demonic entities you better be moving in the power of the holy spirit and that's where you want to get baptized in the holy spirit here so this is kind of cool this is a demonstration of it so afterwards, the four proclaimed, there's power in the blood of Jesus. They recite this aloud for 10 minutes. The spirit calling itself Wesley was described as being subdued at this point. Rogers knew that this was the moment to expel it. Rogers ordered, come out of Karen Kingston in the name of Jesus Christ. All four ministers started commanding this out loud in agreement with Rogers' authority over the subdued spirit. The expulsion of Wesley was reported as being instantaneous with no contortions or violent jerking. See that? That's, that's from the, um, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Very cool. So the, the spirit Wellesley just left. The heaviness of oppression in the air lifted. The spirit was gone. The stench lifted immediately as well. It was now 6.32 p.m. on Saturday, and the ministers were exhausted. My golly, yeah, they've been going since, what, 8 o'clock? Whoa. That's about 10 hours of ministry here. They called it a day, and the first day of the exorcism of Karen Kingston was over. So, yeah, that's kind of cool. So we see the power of praying in tongues and the power of unity, right? Um, amazing. Amazing, amazing. And together in prayer, the proclamation, they subdue the evil spirit. Yep. It, it, like I said, it was two or more, right? There's Jesus. They just, they just tore this thing apart. Very amazing. Cool, cool, cool. All righty. So that wraps up our first day of this. Um, there's actually three days of exorcisms, right? Of uh, the prayers of liberation here. So we just wrapped up the first day. So what do we get? Like four or five of them? We got four, four spirits out today. So we'll wrap up this case here. We'll continue on the next part of the series of, uh, of, 
the following day. So we have two more days to go through. And I'd like to thank everybody that's listening in, all two of my listeners out there in the world. Thank you for tuning in. I'd like to thank my dog for listening as well. Um, if you'd like to support this ministry, please go to a field guide to spiritual warfare.blogspot.com. I believe there's a PayPal uh, button here you can love us with. Help us keep in, keep the lights on here in the M16 bunker and help us keep producing this material to help you guys. Like you said, I said, I have a ton of information. I just, I can't write fast enough. So I think this is the best way to get information out to you people. And so, yeah. And most of all, too, um, as I wrap this up, I do want to dedicate um, this for first podcast to my good friend, Ken Deal, who went on to be at the Lord. He's up there fighting for us now. And I think this, this he's one that got me into broadcasting. So I always want to thank him and his beautiful um, wife, Fair Deal. And again, this, this, this broadcast today is dedicated to Ken Deal, man. I hope I did you justice. God bless you folks and have a good evening.